begin today the Gemara on Dafid Gimel at the Mishnah on the top of the Yomit. We continue here other discussions regarding the argument between the husband and wife when uh, he, he gets married and he, he finds that there's no besulim and the question is what exactly happened? So we had uh, again. Okay, okay, that's the previous Mishnah. In the previous Mishnah, there was the same argument between the husband and wife, and this is also relevant for the Gemara that we're going to learn today. So let me just quickly review what we learned in the previous Mishnah. There it said the husband and wife are arguing about this, and the husband says that you probably had a relationship with someone before you got married to me, and therefore the whole marriage is a mekachtos. That's the terminology the Mishnah used. And she says, no, it was after the Edis and after the first stage of marriage, and therefore, it's your bad luck that this happened to me. But really, when I got married to you, I was a Basula. So there was the argument in the previous mission between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yezer and Rabbi Yeshua, who we believe, Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yezer says she's believed. Rabbi Yeshua says, no, we don't live by the words of her mouth and we don't believe her. Here, in our Mishnah, there's going to be a very similar machlaikis between the same Tanoim. Let's see. So, Telegah Mishnah, he emeres mukisei tzani. So after she, uh, it's discovered that she's not a basula, so she comes and says, you know what happened, Mukasates? There was an accident that occurred, and therefore I'm not a basula anymore. That was a Mika before. And he comes and says, Loiki. No, that's not what happened. It's not that an accident occurred. Someone had a relation with you, and therefore you're not, uh, you weren't a basula because you're a baula. Someone, uh, there's a man that had a relation with you. So what exactly is their argument, just like in the previous mission, they're arguing about the money of the Ksuba, whether she deserves the money of the Ksuba or not. This is also an argument about the money of the Ksuba. But exactly the amount of what he's ready to give her and what she's demanding, that the Gemara will explain. So Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Yezer, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Yezer, say that we trust her, similar to what we learned in the previous Mishnah. And like you mentioned, in the previous Gemara, we learned yesterday, it said that the basis, well, at least one of the reasons why we believe her is because she has a tiniest body. She's saying, she knows for a fact that there was an accident and nothing else. When he says what he says, he's not 100% sure, he's only a Shema. But there's other points to this as well, as we'll see. But Rabbi Shua, and Rabbi Shua says, No, we don't live by the words of her mouth. And therefore, we're going to assume that she's a Becheskas Drusa Sish, that there's a man that had a relation with her before she got married. Until she brings a proof to what she's saying, that it was only an accident, and therefore she's not going to get the ksuba money that she's demanding. How is she supposed to bring a proof? How is she going to bring a proof? I mean, it's not going to be so easy to bring if she has a braya with, uh, for this accident that occurred. Is that Yeshua really saying, Maitzim Rabbi Shua. Is that what he's saying? It's, uh, she's the one that wants to be Maitzim from him money, correct. Yeah, that was one of the svaras that we learned yesterday in the Gemara. Because the money is in her, in his pocket that is, he's the one that has the chazaka, correct? He's the one that has the cheskas moment, no, so she has to bring that ayah. My real question is, why is he saying her ayah? But zuba cheskas drusas, a cheskas drusas. She does some ayah similar to that. And a chanami, you're right. It's an interesting lashon the Mishnah uses, but uh, okay. But the, the Mishnah is saying we're going to assume so, and therefore not allow her to collect the money from the ksuba. Right? Okay, that's not what you're saying. We can assume anything. We can, assume, not, we can assume nothing, but she ayah similar to that. Okay, okay, I hear. So after Gemara, Tainasayu b'mai. What exactly are these, is this argument between husband and wife? In other words, how much money is she claiming that she deserves for the Ksobe, and how much does he want to pay her? So Rabbi Yechelen Rabbi says, B'masayim umana. The argument between them is, the husband says, I'm only giving you one mana, because you were a Ba'ula before you got married to me, so therefore you only deserve one mana. And she says, no, it was an accident that occurred, and therefore I deserve a full Ksobe, 200 Zos. Rabbi Laza says, The argument is that the husband says, sorry, she says that is, that she wants to have at least half of a ksuba, at least a mana. Yes, there was an accident, and I'm not a basula, but I still deserve a mana. And he says, No, you're a ba'ula. A man had a relation with you before, and therefore you deserve nothing. So the Gemara explains the source of their machlaikis, and this is something we learned before in the Gemara already. Rabbi Yechanan says that the argument here is whether she gets 200 or she gets only 100. Because Rabbi Yechanan is saying that our Mishnah follows Rabbi Meir's opinion. Rashi clarifies when it says there, it doesn't mean that Rabbi Yechanan himself agrees to Rabbi Meir's opinion. Rabbi Meir argues with the Rabbana. There's no reason Rabbi Yechanan would follow a, a, tana, a single Tana against the Rabbana. But what he's saying is that our Mishnah here is following Rabbi Meir's opinion. 
What does Rav Meir say? The Omar Rav Meir says regarding Mukaseits, in a case where there was an accident, that it turns out that it was an accident and she was not a Basula when she got married. So Rav Meir said about that, Bein Hikirba or Bein Loi Hikirba, whether this is something that he knew about before or whether he did not know about this before, Masayan, she still gets a full Ksuba of 200 Zuz. So therefore, when she is saying that I'm a Mukaseits, she's demanding the full amount of 200 Zuz. That was Rav Meir's opinion. Whereas the, the, the husband is saying, no, it wasn't an accident. A man had a relation with you and therefore you only deserve half, 100. That's following Rav Meir. Rav Meir and Rav Lazar, which says, that the argument in our mission between the husband and wife <coughs> is whether she gets one mana, she's demanding at least one mana. And the like loam, and the husband says you get nothing. And that is because Rabbi Laz is following the Rabbanan's opinion. What did the Rabbanan say in a case where there was an accident? the Amri. So they said, whether he knew about this accident before, whether he did not, mana. She always gets just the mana. So when she is saying that there was an accident that occurred, she can't be demanding more than a mana. And when the husband says, no, you are a Ba'ula, what's the husband saying? You don't deserve to get even that money either. You get nothing. Again? A Mukas 8 gets one mana, correct. Because her status is not as high as a, as a Basula. And therefore, her value is not the same. It wasn't her fault. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter fault or not. But the fact is, her value is not the same much. Okay, so now the Gemara explains why did each explain the Mishnah according to their opinion. Why Rabbi Lazar explains our Mishnah not the way Rabbi Yechenin did? This we could understand. Because he'd rather explain that our Mishnah follows the majority opinion, which is the Rabbanan. Hello, but Rabbi Yechenin, my time alone, I'm Rabbi Lazar. Why did Rabbi Yechenin not explain the Mishnah like Rabbi Lazar? Why is he saying our Mishnah follows the minority opinion of Rabbi Meir? Answers the Gemara, the reason is because Kosova, Rabbi Yechanan's opinion is Kinsa, Becheskas, Psula. When you marry a wife with the assumption that, or with the status of her being a Psula, and then the Nimtz is Bula, and it turns out that she already had a relation with another man before, Yeshlok Suba Mana. She still does get a Ksuba of a Mana. She doesn't lose it completely. It doesn't become a total Mekkah Tos. Even though the Mishnah in the previous Mishnah used the term Mekkah Tos, but according to Rabbi Yechenin, what does the word Mekach Tos mean? The, no, the number of 200 Zuz that I would have to give you, that's a mistake. But I still would have to give you 100. That's what Rabbi Yechenin holds. So therefore, so, ha -ha, so look at what they're arguing about in our Mishnah. Who come on, mana? He's telling her that you are a Bu'ula from before and there I'm only ready to give you one mana. And the amra mana. If we'll say that our Mishnah follows the opinion of the Rabbana, that when there's an accident, when she's a Mukhisaitz, she also gets a mana. So then she's basically saying the same thing. She's saying, I deserve a mana because I'm a Mukhisaitz. So my tiny di day, the tiny di So what difference is there between his claim and her claim? She's saying, I deserve a mana. And he's saying, I'm ready to give you a mana. So therefore, it must be that our Mishnah follows Rabbi Meir's opinion that when it's a Mukas 8, it's an accident, she actually gets Messiah. So she's arguing that I deserve to get two, two hundred zos. That's the way Rabbi Yechen explains our Mishnah. Okay, but now the Gemara addresses something else. We had over here two Mishnahis that basically are going through the same type of argument between husband and wife. Whether she deserves to get a ksuba, does not deserve to get a ksuba. Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yezah says, Namenes, we believe her. And Rabbi Shua says, no, we don't live by the words of her mouth. The previous Mishnah and this Mishnah. So the question really is, what's the difference here? My Ike, uh, sorry again, where am I holding? Bishleimer, that is. Bishleimer, now it's understood, Rabbi Lazar, according to Rabbi Lazar's opinion. Hainu Diktani Tarti. This is the reason why we have two different Mishnahis here. What are the two Mishnahis? The previous Mishnah is coming to exclude from the opinion of Rami Bachame. What's the opinion of Rami Bachame? So Rami Bachame says that when it comes to a woman that says that she's a Mukis Eitz, everybody agrees that she gets absolutely nothing. So that's one thing that's clear in our Mishnah over here that we just learned, the second Mishnah, this, this Mishnah here, that in the case where she says she's a Mukis Eitz, you can't say that everybody agrees she gets nothing because no, here she's saying she's a Mukhisaitz and she wants to get at least a mana. So that's why it says the case of our Mishnah. 
It, it, it excludes from what Rami Bahama said. We learned this before, if you remember, we learned about the, Rami Bahama's opinion. That, that Rami Bahama said that in a case where it was unknown that this accident happened in advance, before the husband got married to her, and he finds out this information that he didn't know before, so it's a mekech toas. He could say, I had no idea about this, he didn't tell me about this, so you deserve nothing. Here we have a Mishnah where it's a case where the husband did not know anything in advance, and nevertheless, she comes and says there was an accident that occurred, and she still wants to get a ksuba of a mana. So therefore, our Mishnah excludes from what Ami Bahama said. That's why it says this Mishnah. And how about the previous Mishnah, where the argument between them is different. Over there, the argument is not about Mukas Eitz, but there the argument is, a man had a relation with her, but did that relation happen before the Edison, before the marriage, or after the Edison? So what is that Mishnah coming to teach me? The Chada and another Mishnah, the previous Mishnah, La Fuke Midrav Chie Baravin Omer Av Sheishes. It comes to exclude from what Rav Chia Barav and said in the name of Rav Sheishis. What did Rav Chia Barav and said in the name of Rav Sheishis? That even if a man had a relation with her before the marriage, she still gets a ksuba of a mana. It's not a total mekkah tos. So according to Rabbi Lazar, the previous Mishnah uses the term mekkah tos. The term mekkah tos literally means that you get nothing. The whole marriage is a mistake and you get zero. So that's what the previous Mishnah is teaching me. That in the case where she's a bu'ula, she gets zero. So we understand that these two Mishnayas are not repetitive. The previous Mishnah teaches us that if it turns out she's a Bu'ula, she gets nothing. And our Mishnah is teaching us that if it turns out she's a Mokis 8, which is only an accident, she still gets a Mona. But according to Rabbi Yechenen, Tarti Lamali. Why do I need both of these Mishnayas? It basically comes out according to Rabbi Yechenen that whether she was a Bu'ula before, or she was a Mokis 8 from before, the Halacha is the same thing. In the case of a Bu'ula, when it said in the previous Mishnah, Mekach Tos, according to Rabbi Yechonin, Mekach Tos does not mean a complete Mekach Tos, she still gets a mana. And when it says here, Mokes Eitz, by Mokes Eitz, you also get a mana. So if so, the halach of the previous Mishnah and the halach of this Mishnah is basically saying the same thing. The question is, should she get that mana or should she get Masayim? 200 zos. So the, these Mishnahis are then repetitive. And says the Gemara, the, 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 no, but there's still a Chiddush here. True, the amount of money in the argument is the same, but the Chiddush is as follows. Chada, one mission here is lo hidiyacha koichai de Rabban Gamliel. And that is our mission over here. The mission over here, the argument between the husband and the wife shows how far the koich of Rabban Gamliel goes that we trust her. What does this Gemara mean to say? So as Rashi explains, we learned yesterday, the Gemara said that in the previous mission she has a migu. When she comes along and says, oh, you found that I'm not a psula, you know what happened? Someone had a relation with me after marriage, and therefore it's your bad luck. She could have said a much better claim. She could have just said, oh, it's an accident that happened. Why is saying an accident happened a better claim? Because when an accident happens, so then she wouldn't become puzzled to a client. If she would be married to a client, she doesn't become puzzled to be with a client. So it's a much better claim to say that an accident happened. So in the previous Mishnah, she has a migu to be believed. In our Mishnah here, when she comes and says an accident happened, there is no better claim she could have said than that. That's the best claim. So she has no migu. So Rabbi Gamliel is saying that we trust her in our Mishnah even when she has no migu. That's the Chiddush over here in this Mishnah. The Afagav, the Ikkalimeimar. Where am I there? Just a second. Oh, Rabbi Gamliel. So that's this Mishnah. And then the Chada, and one Mishnah, which is the previous Mishnah, the Acha Koycha the Rabbi Shua, comes to let me know how far the opinion of Rabbi Shua goes. And the Gemara now explains what I just said. Kamai said, the previous Mishnah, the Acha Koycha the Rabbi Shua, is letting us know how far Rabbi Shua's opinion goes. The Acha Gav the Kalameimar Migu in the previous Mishnah, when she sort of admits that a man had a relation with her, but she's just saying it happened after the marriage. So over there she has a migu. She could have said that it was only an accident. And still Rabbi Shua says, we can't trust her, we don't live by the words of her mouth. And the second mission that we just learned over here, this is showing us how far Rabbi Gamliel's opinion goes. Even though she has no migu over here, we still trust what she's saying. So why is she still trusted with what she's saying if she has no migu? And don't forget, she's trying to be mighty mamen from her husband's pocket. How could she do that? So we learned yesterday that there's two things. Number one, it's a tiny body versus the husband that only has a tiny shema. But then there's another point. 
And that is that she has a cheskas aguf. Any time there's a suffix, at what point she lost her status of being a basula, we will, we will follow the later point and say that probably she lost it after she already got married. And therefore she has a chazaka that at the time of the marriage she still was a basula. So with that kayak of cheskas aguf, she could be mighty mamain from her husband. So essentially it's interesting, according to this pshat, it comes out that the argument between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua is, what's stronger? Is the cheskas mamain stronger? The money that the husband has in the pocket, Rabbi Yeshua says, the husband has the money in the pocket, that's the strongest chazakeh. And Rabbi Gamliel says, no, the cheska saguf that she has, that's stronger. And therefore, we, uh, trust, uh, we trust the husband to say that probably, she, or we trust her, that is to say, that she became a besula, she was a besula, that is, when she was married. That's, that's the shy love. Like she can be believed. It's not like a public thing, it's a personal thing about her own body. So no, can't, no. You, can't you be believed uh, like <coughs> sword? Again? Like she can say Could be. Okay, I'm not sure about that. Okay, maybe. Okay, let's continue right there. Here we have another case. And also the same Tanoim are arguing whether we tra- take a word for what she says or not. We see a woman is speaking with someone. And as we'll see in a moment in the Gemara, it doesn't literally mean speaking. If she had a relationship with someone, to what extent the Gemara will say? And now... Bezdin comes and asks her, Who is this person? Is a kasher yid? Is he not a kasher yid? And the relevance of this is, first of all, the child that's born, is it a kasher a child? But also the relevance is regarding her herself. The halacha of a woman that has a relation with a person that's possible is, we learned this in the Gemara and Yevamis, she now becomes possible to marry a kayan. So the question is, if she had a relation with a kasher man or a possible man, could she still marry a kayan? And what happens here? So she answers and says, in fact, this person is a kosher yid and he's even a kayin. Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel say, we trust her. So as we'll see in the Gemara, why do we trust her? So she has a cheskas kashras. Because every yid has a chazaka that is a kosher yid. So now when we have a doubt, what happened? Who did she have a relation with? We rely on her cheskas kashras that what she's saying is true. However, Rabbi Yeshua says, no, We can't live by the words of her mouth. We're going to assume that she had a relation with a Nosan or a Mamzer, which are Yidin that are not kosher, and therefore she'll be possible to marry a Kain. And the reason is, of course, there's a concept of Cheskas Kashas, but once we see she's playing around to this extent, she loses her Cheskas Kashas, mm-hmm. as the Gemara will explain. Until she'll prove who this man is that she had a relationship with. A similar case, we see a woman, a single woman, and all of a sudden she's pregnant. And they say to her, who, who, how, how did you become pregnant? And she says, from this and this person, and he is a kain. Again, Rabbi Gamliel Rabbi say, we rely on the cheskas kashras, and she's believed. Rabbi Yeshua says, no, we don't live by the words of her mouth. We consider her to be pregnant from a Nosan and a Mamzer, unless she could prove otherwise. So the Gemara begins with the term the Mishnah used, Midda Beres, a very uh, unclear term. She was just speaking to somebody. What's the problem with speaking to someone? My Midda Beres. What does it mean that she was speaking to a man? So there's two shot in there. Ziidi says, Nistara, she was secluded with this man. And that's what the question is. Who are you secluded with? Ravasi Omar, Ravasi says, not even more than this, Nivala, we know for a fact that there's someone that was Bayala, that she had a relation with someone. And that's the question, who is this man that you had a relation with? So the Gemara now says, Bish, Ziidi, Ziidi that says that all it means is she was secluded with someone. So we can understand why the mission uses the term Medaberes, that she was speaking with him. It means she was speaking with him privately, but there was no actual relation between them. But according to Ravasi, that says that he was boil her. Why would the Mishnah use this expression of Medaberes, which means he was just talking to her? And it says, the Gemara, the Mishnah is using a, a purer, a cleaner language. Mm-hmm. Like we find in a Pasik, it says, She eats and she wipes her mouth. And she says, I did nothing wrong. And the Pasik here uses the term eating, but it really means it's talking about the relation she had with a man. Similar, and Amishna uses the term medaberes, even though it means that he was boiler. Now the Gemara asks further, Bish, according to Ziidi, it's understood, Hainu the Ketani Tarti. This is why we have two cases in the Mishnah which are really talking about the same concept, that she had a relation with someone, and the question is, who's this man? And the Mishnah had two cases here, medaberes, 
Umuhuberes. So according to Zayidi, we understand why there's two cases. Why Medaberes only means that she was secluded with someone. We don't even know that anyone was boil her. Right? So over there, it's a very big chiddush that Rabbi Yeshua says that we don't trust her who this man is. And then we have the case of Muhuberes. Muhuberes, we know for a fact someone was boil her. We see that she's pregnant. And over here, even in such a case where we know for a fact someone was boil her, still Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Leezer says we do trust her. So there's a chiddush. Each one of these cases are different. El or Ravasi, but according to Ravasi, that says that Midaberes also means that we know for a fact someone was boiler. So Tarti Lamali, why do we need these two cases in the Mishnah? Both cases are basically the same thing. Someone was boil her, either because we have Adam that saw that someone was boil her, or we see that she's pregnant, and the question is who this man is? So it's Mamish identical. That's the Gemara. No, there's two, there's the two Chidushim here in the Mishnah. What are they? One case, the first case in the mission is we want to know whether we can be machsha her, whether she's still kosher to marry a kain. And the other case of the mission is regarding if she has a daughter that's born, who's this daughter that's born? Was this bo- daughter born from a mamzer and therefore the daughter will be a mamzeres? Could she marry a kain? The question is regarding the daughter. Mm-hmm. And as, as uh, I mean, we'll see in the Hemshul the Gemara, there's an argument about this, and the Gemara brings it up here. What's the point there? For herself, it's easier, it's easier to trust what she's saying because she has a cheskas kashras. She was born by kashras. She has a cheskas kashras that she can marry a kain. Regarding the daughter that was born, this daughter never had a cheskas kashras. From the, from the moment of the pregnancy, there's a suffix who this pregnancy is from. So to say that we're going to be machshir the daughter based on her words without a direct cheskas kashras for the daughter is a huge chiddush. So that's the chiddush of the second case of the Mishnah. So the Gemara says there's actually an argument about this, as we'll see soon in the Hemshchal Gemara. But aha, Nichol Amandomar, this is a good answer according to the opinion that says the Divrei Machshe Ba Machshe Bibita. The opinion that says, which is Rabbi Gamliel, that we Machshe her, we Machshe the daughter as well. So those are the two cases of the Mishnah. El Amandom the Divrei Machshe Ba Paisel Bibita. But there's another opinion that says that we're only Machshe her herself because she has the Cheskas Kashrus. But the daughter is going to be possible. The daughter has no cheskas kashras. So according to this opinion, even in the second case of the Mishnah, when they're asking this woman, who are you pregnant with? We're not trying to be machshed the daughter that would be born. We're trying to figure out about this woman herself. Who did she, is she kosher or not? So then, Ma'ikalamema, what are we going to say? The question still remains that according to Rav Asi, the two cases of the Mishnah, there's no chiddush here. Because in the first case, we know that someone was boiler. Answers the Gemara. So you're right, you're going to have to say, Ravasi, Sova, Kamandom, Ladivriya Machshaba, Machshabibita. Ravasi that says that the case of here is that in the ratio of the Mishnah, we know someone was Bayolar, so the case of the safe of the Mishnah is that we're being Machshab the daughter. Ravasi is taka following that opinion, and that's the Kiddush of the two cases of the Mishnah. Now the Gemara has another question there. Omelet of Papula Abaye, Rav Papa asks Abaye, Liz Eidi. According to Zaidi that says, what's our Mishnah speaking about? That she was just secluded with someone. But we don't know that someone was boiler. And even there, what did Rabbi Yeshua say? We don't trust her. We don't trust her regarding who this man was. Now the Omar, my Medaberis Nistara, so he said that Medaberis means that she was just secluded with someone. V'om Rabbi Yeshua, like man, Rabbi Yeshua says we don't believe her. Ha'omar Rav, what did Rav say? Malkin ala When you see a woman today, I mean, then today we don't have the halachas of Saita, but when you see a woman that goes and is secluded with a man, you can give her malchus. This is not malchus menateira, this is a makis mardis midrabana, and you can give her lashes for this. It's not appropriate behavior. But, but just because she went and she was secluded with another man, we're not going to ask her to go back to her husband. We're not going to assume that she had any relation with him. So now, leime deloi kerabi shua. Let us say that our Mishnah does not follow what Rabbi Shua said. Because what did Rabbi Shua here say? Even just the fact that she was secluded with another man, and then she comes and says that man was kosher, we don't trust her. So this is not like Rabbi Shua's opinion. Says the Gemara, Philotime Rabbi Shua. You can even say that what, what Av says follows Rabbi Shua's opinion. Maila also be yuchsen. This that Rabbi Shua says in our mission that we don't trust the woman, this is a unique chumre regarding the halachas of yuchsen by kohona. This that uh, we don't allow this woman to go, n- now go and marry a kain, this is a unique chumre for kainim that will machmer not to allow this woman to marry them. But really, uh, otherwise, I mean, in other cases, we would uh, trust her that the person that she had a relation with was a was a kosher was a kosher person. Meisvei, the Gemara now has another question. Again, what we're focusing on over here is the argument between Zidi and Ravasi. What does Midaberes mean in the Mishnah? 
Are we speaking about a case that the, this, this woman was secluded with another man? Or are we speaking about a case where this woman, we know, had a relation with another man? So here there's a Braisa that speaks about what it says in our Mishnah and it spells out more. The Braisa says, We saw this woman that she went with somebody, she was secluded with somebody in a private place. And then the Braisa adds, Oy Or she went into this ruined uh, house, into this uh, dilapidated house. So Rashi says, Chorba, dilapidated house, that's an area, that's a place that was used for Znus. So we basically know that she went and she had a relation with someone there. Now, Allah, they say to her, Mati who is this man that you were with? And she says, Kayanu, the man I was with is a Kayan, and actually, Ben Abahu, he's my cousin, he's my first cousin. So Rabbi Gamliel, again, like it said in our Mishnah, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Yezah, Aymrim Namenes, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Yezah say, we believe her, and Rabbi Shua, Aymrim, Rabbi Shua says, Let me pee on a Chayim. We don't learn, we don't live, that is, by the words of her mouth. We assume that she had a relation with someone that's possible until she proves what she says. Okay, so the Gemara is going to focus on over here is that this Braisa gives two examples. One example is when she entered with a person B'Seiser. And the other example is L'Chorva. So says the Gemara, Bish, According to Zi'idi, that says that what does it mean in our Mishnah when it says Midaberes? Midaberes in our Mishnah means that she was just secluded with someone. So Tani Tarti. So we can understand why our Mishnah says these two different scenarios. L'Seiser. One case is that she was just secluded with someone. And another case is L'chorba. L'chorba is there's a, a real assumption that she actually had a relation with another man. So it's two different, two different cases and there's a Chiddush in each case, as the Gemara already explained before. El Ravasi, but according to Ravasi. The Omar Nivala Ravasi says that the whole argument between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua is only in a case where we actually know that someone was Bayalur. So Tati Lamali. What, what are these two cases that the Braisa is mentioning here that either she went Peseser or into a Khurba? And says the Gemara, Chode Katani. The way to read this Braisa is it's really all one case. L'seiser de chorbe. She entered into a secluded place, but not stam a secluded place, but a secluded place of a chorbe into this dilapidated house, and that itself is a proof that someone was boiled her. That's how you read the Braise. But the Gemara asks on this, but for all l'seiser oy l'chorbe katani. In the Braise it says oy, or, or seiser, or chorbe. So it's not, how could you say it's one case? So the Gemara gives a different answer. Chade l'chorbe de mase. One case is that she entered into this dilapidated house, which is in a city. And the Chada Lachorbe de Dabra. Another case is she entered into this dilapidated house that's out in the field, that's away from the city. And it's, there's a big Chiddush over here. And the Gemara explains it's Rikhi, and the Braith says to tell me both of these cases. Why? If we would only say the case of this Chorbe that's in the city, I would say, Here, Rabbi Gamliel says, I could trust her when she says that the man that she was with is a kosher person. Why? We're talking about a city of Yidin, and most of the people that are in the city are kosher Yidin. When in, in, a, in a regular community, most people, you could assume, are kosher. So her opinion is being backed up by a roiv. There's a, she has a, a majority on her side. But if she went into a dilapidated house, that's out in a field away from the city, the Raif Psulumetzla. Who's drang away from the city? Who's away from all the whole entire community? People that are apostle. People, so over there, most people are apostle. So over here, you're going to trust her even though most people are apostle. So maybe here Rabbi Gamliel would agree to Rabbi Shua that the, like Rabbi Shua said, we can't trust her to say that the man she was with is kosher. And the same thing also in the reverse. Viyash minibahi, if it were only the case. Tell me only the case when she was with a man out, out of the city. Bahi come Rabbi Shua. Over there Rabbi Shua says we don't trust her because most people there are puzzle. Ava Baha, but over here when it's talking about a place inside the city, I would say maybe that Rabbi Shua agrees to Rabbi Gamliel because most people are kosher. Tzricha, that's why it has to say both cases. So there's a huge chiddush that comes out from what the Gemara is saying here, and the Gemara is soon going to say this again, that according to the one that's machsher, that trusts what she says, we trust her even if what she's saying is going against her raiv. In other words, her tiny body and her cheskas kashras is so powerful even going against the raiv. When she's in an area where most people there are apostle, we still trust her that the man she had a relationship was kasher. 
Meisvei, again the Gemara here brings another question, this is a question of Asi, that said that our Mishnah, when it said Midaberes, Midaberes means we know for a fact that someone was boiler. So here the Gemara brings another Braise, where it elaborates on the whole discussion, and we clearly see that Midaberes means just Nistara, that she was secluded with a man. So the discussion here goes as follows. So this Braise is a follow-up to our Mishnah, where there is the case where there was a woman that was uh, speaking to a man or pregnant with a woman, uh, pregnant, with, pregnant from a man, and we don't know uh, from who, and the, uh, Rabbi Gamliel says we trust her, Rabbi Shua says we don't trust her. So the Raisa says, Zu eidos sha isha Rabbi Gamliel says, this is an eidos that we trust a woman, and Rabbi Shua, Rabbi Shua says, Eidon amenes, we do not trust her. Like we learned in our Mishnah. But now the Raisa says, what was the discussion between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Shua? So Amalem, Rabbi Shua, Rabbi Shua says to Rabbi Gamliel, how could you trust her? And they bring the, the following case. Wouldn't you agree? If there's a, a the Jewish woman that was in captivity, and there's Edom to this, we know for a fact that she was captured. And when she's redeemed from this captivity, she comes and says, I'm pure, nobody had any relation with me. Everybody would agree in such a case that she's not going to be believed because if these Goyim capture this woman, they captured her because they wanted to play around with her. And we can't believe it when she says that she's still Tahira. So we know she had a relation with a guy, with someone that's not kosher. So basically Rabbi Shua is saying, just like in this case of a woman in captivity, we don't trust her over here as well. When we have this woman that was secluded with somebody or, or we see that she's pregnant, we can't trust her to say that she's kosher. Oh, one second. So the Gemara says, Amru, Amru Lois, so Rabbi Gamliel says to Rabbi Yeshua, Aval. Uh, Aval means yes, it's true. That's the title of Aval over here. In the case of a woman that was, was in captivity, I would agree to you that over there she's not believed. So Rabbi Yeshua asks, So Uma Hefresh Yesh bin Zuluzu. So what's the difference between a woman in captivity and the case that we're speaking about over here when she had a relationship with another man, and, but even though she was not in captivity? So the answer, the difference is very simple. Lezu yesh Edim. Over there, there are Edim that she was in captivity. And once she's in captivity, it's as if we have clear Edim that she had a relation with one of those people. Because they're, like you said, they're, they're, they're capturing her for this reason, against her will, to have a relation with her. But a Lezu ain't la Edim. Over here, there are no Edim that he was boiler. There's just Edim that we see that uh, she was Midaberes, she was with somebody, but we don't know if he was Bayolar. So therefore Rashi says, what does that mean? She has a Migu. She could have just came along and said, me, relation with this man? I never had a relation with him. She came and says, I had a relation with him, but he's a kosher person. So she has a Migu. So therefore she's believed over here. Amalehem, so Rabbi Yeshua says, wait a minute. But there's another case here. Over here, Aflazu Yesh Edom, over here, it's, it's like we have Edom. It's very clear that she had a relation with another man. She had a Kresa ben Shiner. Her stomach is between her teeth. This is an expression for the fact that she's pregnant. One of the cases where Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua argued is a case where she's pregnant. So we know for a fact she had a relation with another man. Just like in the case of captivity, we know for a fact that she had a relation with someone. Over here we also have this as a fact. And still Rabbi Gamliel says we believe her. So why do we believe her? Okay, so now the next part of the Braise is not clear. The Gemara will explain it, but first let me read the words of the Braise and then we'll see how the Gemara explains it. Now, Omru Loi, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Yezer, said to Rabbi Yeshua, Roiv oivde kechavim prutzim ba'arayisem. When it comes to being captured amongst Goyim, it's different. Most Goyim are steeped into Arayis, and therefore we can be sure that they had a relation with her. Okay, what exactly this is a response to, the Gemara will explain. And then Omar Lehen, Rabbi Yeshua responded and said, Ein apetrupis la arayis. When it comes to arayis, there's nobody that's a caretaker. We can't trust anybody when it comes to a situation of arayis when there's a husband or when there's a man that is, when there's a man and a woman that are alone. Then the Bryce uh, concludes and says, isha begufa. This entire argument here, whether we trust her or not, is all regarding the status of the woman herself. But if the relevance of the edus of this woman is regarding the status of her daughter, everybody would agree that the status of the daughter that's born, or the, the, even the, the, the son that's born, is a shtuki. What does the word shtuki mean? So literally shtuki means that whoever wants to ask us who this child is, we quiet him down because we don't know who this child is. But the Gemara is going to discuss soon this concept of shtuki, as we'll see. Okay, but first the Gemara clarifies the conversation here between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua, and then it comes back to prove 
what our mission was speaking about. Now, my ka'ama lohu or my ka'mahadri lay. Over here in the conversation in the b'raise, it's not clear exactly what they were saying to one another. So how do we understand this b'raise? So the Gemara explains as follows. Hachi ka'amri lay. This is what Rabbi Gamliel was saying to uh, Rabbi Yeshua. Heshaftanu alamu beres. When you brought a riot from a woman that's in captivity, that we can't trust us, and you compare that to the case that we were arguing about, so you gave a very good uh, comparison to the case of Mo'obedes, in a case where we know for a fact that she had a relation with a man because she's pregnant. So Rashi says, basically, Rav Gamliel was saying that this is, this is an answer that we can't, we have nothing to say about this. That if in a case where a woman is captured, we can't trust her, who had a relation with her, the same thing if she's pregnant, we can't trust her either, because in both cases, it's clear that someone had a relation with her. So that we don't have an answer to. But, but what are you going to answer regarding the case of Midaberes? Which means it's only a case where she was secluded with another man. But we don't know if she had a relation with another man. How could you compare that case to a woman that was actually captured? Amar lehem, so Rabbi Yeshua answers, Midaberes, Hainu Shvuya. No, my opinion is that a woman that's secluded with another man is the same like being captured. There's no difference. Amrulai, so to that, Rabbi Gamliel said, Rabbi Gamliel, and Rabbi Yezus said to Rabbi Yeshua, how could you compare the two? Shani Shvuya, the Rav Evdikichav, and Prutzim Ba'arai, the same. If she was captured by Goyim, so that Prutzim Ba'arai, they're steeped into immorality, so for sure they had a relation with her. If she, was, if she was secluded with another man, why should we assume that he had any relation with her? Amalehem, so to that, Rabbi Yeshua responded, Ha Nami, in this case as well, if she was secluded with another man, Kivin the Istate, once she was secluded with him, Ain Apetrupis La Arais. There is no caretaker that we can't trust anybody in such a situation, and therefore she loses her Cheska's Kashris because she was secluded with another man. So what do we see here in our Mishnah? The, the part of, a big part of the whole discussion between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Galil was, should we compare the cases of our Mishnah to a woman in captivity? And they were, they were discussing both cases. The case of Midaberes, when she was only secluded with another man, and the case of Meuberes, when, she know, when we know that she was pregnant with another man. And both of those cases, the question is, could we compare it to a woman that was in captivity? So what do we see from all of this? Says the Gemara, Katani Mies, so it's pretty clear in this Braise. So we learn Tarti, that there are two different scenarios here. Midaberes or Mo'uberes. The case of Midaberes is when she was only secluded, but we don't know whether anyone else was Bailer or not. And then the case of Mo'uberes, when we know for a fact that someone was Bailer. So to Yuf to the Ravasi, this refutes Ravasi's opinion. Ravasi said that Midaberes is also a case where we know for a fact that someone was Bailer. And it's, it's identical to the case of Mi'uberes. But in this b'raisa, we clearly see that there was a distinction made between those two cases. So to Yifte, this completely refutes Rav Asi's opinion. Okay, Taisvis over here, just to add an interesting svara, Taisvis still says that the case of captivity is not exactly the case of a woman that we know for a fact that she's pregnant. Even though in both cases we know for a fact someone was boiler, but Taisvis says when she's in captivity, we know she's in captivity amongst guy. So therefore for sure the ones that were boiler are apostle. But when it comes to a woman that's, that had a relation with a man, Taisa says a very interesting svara, that there's a, there's a chazaka by a woman, isha by dekes umazana. Even before she goes to have a relation with someone that's not her husband, she first finds out who's this guy. Is he a kashariyid? Is he not a kashariyid? Because she doesn't want to have problems in the future to be possible to a kain. So there's a chazaka that a woman is by dekes umazana. So Rabbi Gamliel held it's still not the same thing. Okay, zak the gemare, v'tepe klei. So now, again, what? So to, to know that, uh, that the, the husband yeah. is still kosher. Husband. No, but to, to know that he's still kosher, though. Which kosher was it in? Remember over here, which tesis it is. It's uh, one of the tesis over here. Okay. Zak the gemare ve teipik lei da hosam roiv psula metzla. Ve hocha roiv kshede metzla. The question, though, is, what's, what is the gemare saying over here? That we're comparing the case of, of uh, a woman that was in captivity to a woman that was with a man. How can you compare the two things? Over there, when she's in captivity, she's amongst mostly Goyim. So it's all Psulim. And over here, it's a case where it's Reif Kshayim. She's had a relation with a man, but she's in a city with a community of Yidin, and it's all Kshayim. How Bechlal did Rabbi Shua make this comparison, Bechlal? It's like the so the, 
Yeah. Well, again, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. So the Gemara answer is, Misayeya Leila Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So this proves what Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said. This goes back to a point that we saw already before. The Amr Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, Ledivri Amachshir, the opinion that says that we kasha her. In other words, we trust her. We trust her that the one that she had a relationship was a kosher yid, even in a case where it's mostly psulim, which would be a, a case that the Gemara mentioned before when she was outside the city in a place where there's mostly psulim. The one that says that we don't trust her, which is Rabbi Yeshua, and he passes her. She will be puzzled even in a case where it's mostly kshedim. As we learned before, Rabbi Shua's opinion is that once she was with another man, she loses her cheskas kashras, and therefore even in a case where there's reif kshedim in that place, we do not trust her. Amr Rabbi Yechenen, Rabbi Yechenen says, now this goes back to what was mentioned before in the Gemara, whether the discussion over here is to trust her regarding her own status, or also to trust her regarding the case where she's mu'ubedes, regarding a child that's born as well. So Rav Divri the opinion that says that she is kosher, machshubibita. So he holds, Rav Gamliel, Rav Liezer, they hold that the daughter would be kosher as well. Rav Divri Ha'paisulba, Rav Yeshua, the opinion that says that the mother is not trusted and she's puzzle, paisulbibita. So the daughter, of course, is going to be puzzle as well. But Rabbi Lazar says, no, it's not the same thing. The opinion that says that we trust her and the mother is kosher, so it's only the mother that's kosher. But but the daughter will still be posel. We can't compare the kashers of the mother to the kashers of a child that was, was, was born. Omar Rabbi explains, what's the difference between the mother and the daughter? The Rabbi, my time with Rabbi Lazar, what's the reason for Rabbi Lazar's opinion that we don't compare them? So the Gemara explains, Bishlaimi ihi isla chazake the kashras. When it comes to the mother, the mother was born the kashras. The mother has a status of being a kosher woman to be able to marry a kayin. So therefore, when she says that she was with a kosher man, we rely on that cheskas kashras to kasher her. But bito lesla chazake the kashras. This daughter that's born here, from the moment of pregnancy, there was a doubt. What is her, her identity? Who is this uh, woman pregnant from? So therefore, there's no chazaka of kashras for the daughter. So this is actually a very strong svara, and there's a big discussion in Rishayim regarding the opinion of Rabbi Yechanan that says that we're machshed the mother and we're machshed the daughter. Why are we machshed the daughter without a cheskas kashras? So some say we could be machshed the daughter even without a cheskas kashras because of the tainas body of the mother. The taina, the, 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 the certain taina of the mother is so strong that we could be machshed the daughter. But there are other Rishayim that clearly say that the cheskas kashras of the mother will work for the daughter as well. That if the mother has a cheskas kashras, we assume that based on her cheskas kashras, she had a relation with a kosher man, and therefore the daughter would be kosher as well. Hey, so Rabbi Loza, Rabbi Yechenen. So Rabbi Loza asks on Rabbi Yechenen's opinion that we kasher the daughter as well from the brisa that we quoted before. What did it say at the end of that brisa? Regarding what, what is this whole discussion, if we trust the woman or not, regarding this woman herself, if she her own status. Regarding the woman's testimony that's relevant for the daughter, for the status of the daughter, everybody agrees that the status of the daughter would be that she is a shtuki. Now what does shtuki usually mean? My love doesn't shtuki usually mean shtuki upasl. Shtuki means that when anyone asks, what's the identity of this child, we quiet him down because we don't know, and therefore the child is puzzled. So over here we see that we do not trust the mother for the child, even though we trust the mother for her own status. So answers the Gemara, Rabbi Yechen will say, Loi shtuki v'kosher. When it says a shtuki, it does mean shtuki, that we quiet down someone when he asks about this child, but the child is still kosher. So as Rashi says over here, the shtuki is like a partial shtuki. He's not going to be considered puzzle like it usually means when we use the term shtuki that we quiet him down because the child is a mamzer and so on but a partial shtuki but the child is still kosher and the Gemara will explain so then why is it that we refer to him as a shtuki do we ever find that we use this expression of shtuki and the child is still kosher says the Gemara in yes Shmuel, like we had was something that Shmuel said Omar Shmuel, Shmuel said the following Aloche, I saw the Kainim Aimdim, when you have ten Kainim that were standing together. And then one of them went and had a relation with a woman, and we don't know who the father is. Which one of these ten Kainim was it? Havlad Shtuki. The child that's born is a Shtuki. 
So here he uses the same expression that the child is a shtuka, we quiet on someone that asks us about this child. Now what does the expression of shtuki mean when Shmuel used it? My shtuki, what does this mean? If you'll say it means that we quiet down this child himself. If he wants to inherit from his father's possessions, so then that's something Shmuel would not have to say. Pshita, that's obvious. Do we know who his father is? He can't even tell us who his father is. How would he demand to inherit his father? Ella, rather, what does it mean? Shemashtikin oisai midin kohuna. The word shtuki over here cannot mean that the child is possible because we know for a fact that his father is a kosher kayan. It was one of these ten kosher kayan, we just don't know who the father is. Over here, shtuki means that we quiet him down when he demands that he wants to serve in the base of mikdash. He can't come in to serve in the base of mikdash as a kayan. Why? The chsev, the postic says, regarding the serving of the Beis HaMikdash, So what is this Bris This is actually in this week's Parsha, regarding Pinchas, where it's given to him the kaya, to be a Kayan, and it's a Bris Kuhun HaSaylam. What do we learn from here when it says, Loi Only a child that there is a Yichas, that you know clearly your lineage, you know who your father is, then you could serve in the Beis HaMikdash. So Yatzazeh, that excludes this child here that's born, Sheng Zadam Yuchasachrov, that the child here does not know who his father is. So therefore, the term Shtuki Shmuel used is, Shtuki does not mean that the child is totally puzzled. Shtuki means he's a kosher child, he's a Kayan, but he can't serve in the Beis Mikdash. So similar we could say regarding the Braisa before that says that the child born is a Shtuki, it means that if the child will be born and there's a question if he's a kosher child or not a kosher child or if it's in a keva, if she can marry a Kayan or not, she's kosher, she can marry a Kayan. Why did it use the term Shtuki? That if the child was a Zachar and he wants to serve in the base of Mikdash, we'll quiet him down and we won't allow him to serve in the base of Mikdash. Similar to what Shmuel said.